speaker of the day is Ty Ruggles. He'll be talking about archaeoastronomy. Archaeoastronomy? One of the few words in the English language has four vowels altogether, didn't it? Okay. Uh, well, actually, what I was asked to do was not to just lecture to you and talk to you with a PowerPoint, but actually to answer your questions. So I come here prepared to spend an hour with you just firing random questions at me. Um, but what I thought might be just an idea was to show you five or six PowerPoint, actually it looks like eight, just to break the ice, because I know if I say, right, ask me something. Um, so I'll do that first, and then you see the blank blue one. That is your threat. That is at the point at which, if you haven't come up with lots of questions, then you start to get the rest of it. So, um, but I'd much rather just to talk about the things that you're interested to find out about, and we'll just take it informally from there. Um, but let me just uh, show you the first few, because I'm like, let me show you the first through few of these. Um, I guess what I'm, uh, what I'm meant to be doing, apart from tripping over, is talking to you about what archaeoastronomy is and what we do. You know, in, in as much as you would like to find out about it and maybe um, spread the word. And um, so I start with just one definition of it. Um, you'll find loads of definitions out there. Um, study of beliefs and practices concerning the sky in the past. I guess that was clear enough. Um, and as you're aware, there is also ethno-astronomy, where the past substitute present. And there's also the problem that, well, there's two problems with talking about archaeoastronomy and ethnoastronomy. One is that it's a complete mouthful, even I can't say it properly. And the second is that the crossover point is a bit blurry. What happens when you're talking about indigenous peoples 100 years ago? Is that history or is it ethnography? Is it ethnohistory? Um, so most of us prefer to speak about cultural astronomy to mean the whole lot together. But what I will do today is to just concentrate, because others will talk to you about, cut more about the ethno-astronomy. I will just try and specify talking about um, the archaeological side this morning. But the important bit about this that I don't want to miss out is the uses to which people's knowledge of the sky was put. The point being that although a lot of astronomers are involved in archaeoastronomy, what drives us is not just finding evidence for people's having some interest in the sun or the moon or the Pleiades in the past, but why they had that interest. What was the context of that? What does that interest tell us as archaeologists or anthropologists about the culture that we're interested in? Um, and of course, if we're interested in evidence in the past, especially in prehistory where we don't have other uh, written evidence, then we can try and get clues from various places, most obviously from monuments, and you'll see a range of monuments there that strike up thoughts about ancient astronomy among various people for various reasons. Um, and I show you pyramids and Stonehenge and this, which is a thing called the Caracol, it's a Mayan site in, in Mexico all of which are claimed to have astronomical connections, most of those claims, in most of those cases, are in fact unproven. But there are astronomical connections. And one of the things about this whole field is there's an awful lot of rubbish out there spoken about it. And this is the big, big difficulty. If you find people have heard of archaeoastronomy at all, they tend to think of the Giza pyramids, and they tend to think of the Giza pyramids because, if I'm lucky, oh no, it's not the next thing, because of um, the Orion Mystery, a big popular book that came out talking about how the pyramids map, basically the layout of the pyramids on the ground, uh, map the position of Orion in the sky, um, and they go further than that, and they say this proves that all the archaeologists were wrong, and the, 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 the pyramids are much, much older, and so on. And it's all nonsense. And the problem, it stems from something that is statistically nonsense. Like if you find points, if you find enough pyramids, and you kind of leave out a few that don't fit, and you include a few, <laughs> and you do the same with stars, and you find a red layout of stars, and maybe one or two don't fit, so you leave those out. Then, of course, you find you get a very good fit between the positions of monuments on the ground, and it's just 
it's, it's playing with statistics and it's, it's, it's nonsense. And then if you go further and try and make something culturally of that which goes against all the other evidence, oh dear. Um, so there's a lot of that about, and one of the most important things, I think, to, to get across in this field is that it is exciting, but is it not, not exciting for those reasons? You have to sort of clear away that and then get at the stuff that's actually there. Um, for a long time, archaeologists particularly were polarised by this because um, you would get all this popular stuff, and I have to say some in the past, a number of professional astronomers got involved in, in this side of things um, uh, too heavily. Um, and the, a lot of archaeological back, uh, back reaction was that this is all nonsense. There was no connection with astronomy in the past. And then there would be this big argument between astronomers and archaeologists. And of course, as with everything, the answer is in the middle. It's nothing like all this stuff, but it is. It is there, and it tells us about people in the past. And what's more, when we find out what's really there, it's not us coming along with our 20th, 21st century minds and seeing what we want to see in the past. It's actually telling us about... Um, hopefully about things that we're actually going on. Um, so something that we do a lot of, but not exclusively, is find out where things are pointing, whether we're looking at monuments and other things. Because alignments in monuments tell us quite a lot about the people who made them. Not that they were necessarily setting up observing posts to measure the, the sun. We can find tombs in the past that were pointing at sunrise, the sun comes in and only shines up the bones, shines light onto the bones of the dead, like for 10 minutes in the morning around the, the December solstice or something like this. People weren't doing that. People didn't go into the tomb and sit amongst the bones of the dead and say, well, is it the shortest day of the year yet? You know, if you wanted to do that, you'd set up a couple of wooden posts or set up by a tree. Um, they did it because they made this magnificent tomb for their ancestors. They lined it up the sun. What that's telling us is that some connection existed in their minds between death, ancestors, and ancestor spirits, and the sun, and seasonality, seasonal renewal. And of course, we can speculate exactly what the nature of that was. We don't know. But what that connection is telling us is that what, what the alignment is telling us is that that connection existed. And that's, that's kind of important. And that's telling us something culturally. Um, okay, so we measure alignments, and uh, we have to be a bit careful with measuring alignments, of course, because everything points somewhere. You know, I can, I can find you modern buildings that point at the solstice by looking up of them, I'll find one, um, and that doesn't prove that was deliberate. So just because we find alignments in the past doesn't mean that they were deliberate, and so we have to have something about the cultural context. And what we like to do is to have cultural questions we're asking that lead us to look at orientations and alignments, and which may be related to many different things, not just astronomy. <clears throat> and of course, we have to know our basic astronomy in order to interpret the astronomical side. And what we tend to do, I don't know how, whether you want me to go into this, but, um, and in fact, I'm meant to be listening to you, but I'll let me just tell you, tell you this much. What we tend to do is, that to measure an alignment, all we have to do is measure the direction of something. Find the observer. I'm standing at my, my favourite site, um, and I'm wondering whether it points at the I don't know, sunrise in midsummer or something. Um, I should be doing it that way down here, okay, so sunrise. Um, and um, I'm looking at that, well, what do I do? Do I wait for December until midsummer and then decide, right, okay, let's go and see whether the sunrise is there? I don't have the time for that. So what I do is I get my instruments out, and if I'm doing a quick job, you might wonder why I call this, then I have my various portable instruments with me. And so uh, the instrument that you'll not be surprised to see is just a, a plain magnetic compass. But it's actually a special one because it's um, not one of these ones you put here and try and work out to within 10 degrees where it's pointing. But one I can put up to my eye and I can see a scale and a pointer and I can sight on the horizon. And so I can work out to perhaps a degree, maybe quite finely, where something is pointing. And if I can then work out the magnet, if I know the local magnetic correction, if I do lots of safety checks to make sure there aren't magnetic bits of iron around that are going to affect it, um, so on, um, I can work out, um, well, you know, to a degree or so, the azimuth, which is the bearing of something. And I can correct that to be a, a true azimuth. And then if I'm slightly more sophisticated, I can get out one of these things, which is a 
a compass clinometer, which is rather fragile. Um, basically, one end of it's just a compass like before, but it has another end, which is a clinometer, which does the same thing, except now this is measuring the altitude, which is the other angle up. This doesn't need magnetic stuff, all it needs is a bubble to get it horizontal. And so with a portable instrument, I can work out these two angles, the azimuth and the altitude. Uh, they tell me, they specify any direction from me as an observer. And from that direction, I can work out, like if I'm pointing towards a point on my horizon, then I can work out the astronomy, what rises and sets there from that. And I can work out also, I can know what rows are set there in the past. Um, and that's where the, the modern astronomy where the, the, the comes in. And the parameter I use to, to do that is a thing called declination. Nothing to do with magnetic declination, if any of you know that one, which is the correction, it's astronomical declination. But basically, all I need to know is my, alti my azimuth, my altitude, my latitude, and some things about refraction to uh, uh, how to work it out, I work out the declination. Um, I don't know how many of you are from astronomy or science teachers as opposed to from other disciplines. Many? Most of you from social sciences or other things? Most of you? Yeah, okay, that's fine then, good. Okay, so the easiest way to, to explain declination is to ignore anything you've ever heard from an astronomer on the subject. No. Okay, um, because basically we know, don't we, that, well, that basically the sky is one huge sphere with all the stars stuck on it. That's what you see. So, so, so let's just assume it's like that. And basically we stand on the Earth, which is fixed, and this big sphere just goes around once a day with all the stars stuck on it. That's how it really is. And of course we don't see the bottom half because that's underneath the Earth, which is flat, but just, it just cut off at the edges. But there's just this sphere going round. And if you've got a sphere going round you once a day, then you can define a North Pole and a South Pole. Oh, that's sorry. Let me, I'm sorry, I think I need to to the Latin. A North Pole and a South Pole. And so the sphere is going round once a day. And, and all the stars are going round, think about it, on lines of constant latitude on that sphere. They're all stuck on it. And so declination is just a, 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 another term for that line of of uh, latitude on this celestial sphere. We talk about celestial south pole, celestial north pole, and declination. I'm sorry, that's a northern declination. We're in China here, by the way, but just, just switch the direction to, to get to where you are. Um, and once we know the declination, we know what rises or sets, depending on looking east or west. And also, from the astronomy, we know what would have risen and set there in the past, because we can wind the clock back and take into account the different changes. Okay. Um, oh yes, that's again uh, the wrong latitude, but showing the general principle. Um, and so you can do this with these sort of portable instruments, which I'm happy to pass around if you, if you want, or you can see at the end, whichever you prefer. Um, this one is fragile, shouldn't be dropped, has been dropped two or three times, the result of which is that you can't really quite see that scale and I need to buy a new one. The next time I shall buy a new one from Finland rather than the UK because they make better ones. Evidence, by the way. You're welcome to look at it. Um, and you can, so you can do it that way for the quick job. For um, a less quick job and a more accurate job, we can use a field light, a, a standing surveying instrument. Um, we can then measure angles much more accurately, of course. But we have to do time observations of the sun or the star or something to, to get our north direction. The other way we can do it is with the GPS these days. Um, and I mean, you, you, I have a simple handheld GPS that I bought in, the, in, the, in 1999 from a Walmart in the US for 60 US dollars, and it still worked perfectly fine. Um, but of course, the problem with using a GPS to define directions is you have to go to both ends, and you, um, these things will only be good to 10 meters or so. Um, here I'm standing in the Nazca Desert looking like a Martian with a funny thing on my back. That's a special GPS that has correction. Um, which gets you down to sub-meter accuracy. And so that is, what, that is a viable tool if you're somewhere like the Nazca Desert, or some, some like environment where you need to do a lot of walking to get things, that's another way to do it. We have different instruments, but all we're essentially doing is measuring as an altitude to get the direction and work out what rows are set there. 
And then, okay, oh, that's, that's just showing you. So then I can find out my declinations. Declinations are plus 90 at the north celestial pole, minus 90 at the south one. So the southern declinations are negative by, um, by convention. Okay, oh, that, yeah, you don't know about that. And of course, we have various ever more subtle ways these days of presenting the data. Um, and this is one, again, this is actually for Hawaii now, so we're at about 20 degrees north latitude. Um, but here you can see um, we, we, had a, we have a digital terrain model and a clever guy in Adelaide who made, who's written a program to show horizons, visualize horizons, which is great because we do a lot of surveying work in Hawaii and it's usually cloudy. Um, and so we can get these, the time when people were using these horizons is like six o'clock in the morning when they're clear. Um, and so if we can't get out there at six every day, we can get them generated by this computer generation. We can see all our azimuths and altitudes and so on. We can, we can see the horizon <coughs> setting paths of things. Um, but we can also do visualizations. There's lots of software around there that shows us where things relate, for example, to the Southern Cross and stuff. So that's vaguely what we do, um, at least if you're measuring orientations. There's a whole set of questions about what we, what we do, why we do it. I hope you're asking me why we do it, and I will prattle on about that. Um, but I just wanted to mention so that the, the, I'm always asked, well, what discoveries, what exciting discoveries have you made? And the answer is, normally we don't make exciting discoveries. Well, we make discoveries that are exciting to us because we're asking specific questions about cultures in the past. We're finding out new things. Um, but, but cultures in the past generally are rather complicated. So you never get wonderful, clear answers like, like you do if you, you, know, if, if you, you speculate and then you write, write the Orion mystery book. We get more complicated answers, which kind of are, are more difficult to put across. But that's why this site was a bit exceptional, because here we got a, a very clear answer. Uh, it's, uh, it was a site uh, I know a Peruvian colleague discovered um, 10 years ago. Um, and it's um, one of only two places in the world that we're aware of where there was a very clear defined observing point. This was a very important place. We have lots of um, detritus there. Um, ritual offerings were made at this place. It's an open doorway where you look out on the 13 towers, huge towers, 6 metres tall, uh, 10 metres wide, rectangular towers, a bit ruinous now. And there were gaps between the towers, and they just span the arc where the sun rises at different times of the year. Um, this is at uh, this is latitude seven degrees south or so. Um, so here's the sun rising and the winter solstice in June, just down there. Um, and this basically would have functioned as a device for you could tell the day of the year um, for the whole year. Um, every ten days or so, it would appear. Uh, in a new slot between two towers. And what that tells us, and, and uh, what we learn from that and so on, is a, another story which I, I, I wouldn't distract myself by. But the point was that that was a, a spectacular, spectacular discovery, and you, you do occasionally make these. Um, but generally, what we're doing is just part of a much bigger um, process in archaeology. We're looking at complex things in the past. We're trying to get some clues about that from the astronomy, along with all the other clues that archaeologists get. It's the blank slide time. So, I'm sorry, even then, I, I was intending not to speak, but you, you can see what I'm like. If you let me get on to the next one, I'm just going to be paddling on to you, won't get a word in edgeways. So, I intend to stand here and drink a glass of water. From, but, but if you, just anything you'd like to ask, like what is or why do I do it, and so on, we'll just lean on and see where we go. Yeah. Those. Well, if I don't break a leg first. Those, those stone towers, they're, they're constructed. Yeah, so you don't get a good sense of, of uh, scale from, from this, but they're, they're constructed. So they're, they're deliberately constructed. They're right? deliberately constructed. They, they actually have a staircase going up each side so you can walk up and down uh, and, the tower. And the distance from the observing point to the stone towers, roughly? 150 to 200 metres. Oh, yeah, yes, it's not, it's not far at all. Yes, I'm sorry you get no real idea from that. Maybe, no, actually, having said that, it's more like 300. I was thinking on the fly. So they're quite close. 
Um, and when you stand down here, well, you can see they form your, your skyline. Um, so yes, it's, it's constructed. And of course, there are arguments. We have specialist arguments about what they were for, and uh, there, are, there are some who, who um, doubt this explanation completely. Um, we have one of the contexts for this is that we know from Inca times, which is skipping forward 1500 years, that the people used towers on the horizon to mark sunrise and sunset for political purposes. And that was all to do with maintaining the Inca social hierarchy and the Inca being regarded as the embodiment of the sun and so on. Um, what well, one thing we suggest is that this may be some distant precursor of that, obviously not um, connected. But an instance where we seem to have a social hierarchy here, an important person, be it the priest or the chief, who's directing things from here, but there were many people in the plazas feasting and playing pan pipes and things. Um, and so we think there's a social hierarchy probably being sustained uh, by, by some observations here too. Um, I'm prattling on and going off on a, on a tangent here, but um, uh, yes, but there are also people that say, well, actually, maybe it was just a sort of richly, to be richly walked along for other purposes, and that, that even that arc of it is coincidental. Um, but one problem with this is that you can never prove, actually prove it, unless you have some written evidence or some ethnographic evidence, someone saying, this is what we did. Once we're into prehistory, we never quite have that, but there are levels at which you argue things and levels at which they're convincing. And how that convincingness comes out, you can come from the anthropology, what you know about the culture, what you know about people in general, or from statistics, if you've got lots of things all doing the same sort of stuff. And how you play those together is one of the big issues for us. Does it um, matter as if you, you know, this time is fine? Oh, they do, but we know we know how they changed. Um, so I don't I don't know whether you went into any of this, but the um, if we're looking at things aligned on stars, then the change is quite severe. Yeah. Um, so this you know this this is precession, yeah. precession of the equinoxes. That that so that affects where the star effectively. You know, I, I say you've got celestial sphere with all the stars stuck on it, but essentially that kind of shifts over ever so gradually, so the north and south poles are in a different position relating to the stars over a great long cycle, 26,000 years. Um, but what this actually means is that if you've got something pointing on the horizon and, I don't know, Antares or something rises there at some point, sorry, get used to doing rising this way, um, rises there, then um, uh, come a couple of hundred years later, it will have shifted away from that. Um, and so it will change quite, quite significantly. Yeah. You know, and, and, um, uh, so you have to take that into account. Um, for the sun, that's not, that, that doesn't make any difference for the sun or moon. But what makes a difference there is the obliquity, the, ecliptic, the tilt of the Earth with respect to its orbit around the sun. Um, and so that tilts very gradually. Um, and what that means is that the positions of the solstice, sunrise and sunset now are about a sun diameter inside where they were going back 5,000 years, it's that sort of time scale. So if you're looking at something, this is only like 2,000 something years old, but already those solstitial positions will be half the sun diameter out from where they were then. So, I mean, it still kind of works, yeah. and in the middle it doesn't make much difference, but um, we, can, we know that and we can correct for it. I was yeah. just wondering if it related to those who, who um, proved the idea, yeah, I mean, would they use that as an argument that that's the end of it? Yeah. And now I'm switching to that. Um, yeah, there, there's... You have to prove it. What you're saying, people use that dating to make a... An no, no, you, what, what you guys have discovered is that it's, you know, the June salt yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. And those are saying that it was just a ritual walk or something like that. Yeah. And not agreeing with what you described. Right, right. I mean, could they use that as an argument? No. Yeah. They can use lots of other arguments. They can't use that one because we all know what the sun was doing yeah. then and we can all measure where those are now. So, yes, and, and, and I mean, if I came along and said this is where the sun rises, uh, and so therefore it rose then at that time, they could, they could say, no, you're wrong. But given I'm not saying that, you know, they, um, you know we, 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 can argue, we can argue the toss on cultural grounds and on statistical grounds, but the basic data of the alignment and where the stones are, we should all agree on. Yeah, it's really easy to do with it. Yeah. Of course, one of the other 
issues. You're, you're going to find this, I'm afraid. I'll elaborate around all the questions are asked and ask questions you didn't ask and so on. Uh, one of the other problems is the selection of data. Um, and it's all very well with the sun and the moon, but if people are postulating that something was aligning on a star, and if you've got no cultural evidence for that, but all you know is the site's you know, roughly 2,000, roughly 5,500 years old or whatever from your archaeology, the problem is the star shifts so significantly that if you only take 50 brightest stars in a 500 year span, you cover a third of the horizon wherever you are. So, you know, you, you can play games and it probably means nothing. So you have to be very careful about that. With the sun, we know that the, the solstices, the, the sun, they were important in cultural contexts all over the world at different times. Um, because it's not just the fact that that's the longest and shortest days, which of course matters less when you're close to the tropics, but it's also the limit of where you've never seen the sun rising on the horizon. And those directions were spatially important very often. Equinox is another matter in time, but, but the, the, the solstices, you have some, some idea that they were um, generally important. Sorry, I want to adjust how, how frequently this idles. Yes, it is on. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, we. Um, I've lost myself anyway, yeah. <laughs> I answered your question in two more besides. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hi there. Hello. Um, I want to ask um, what are some of the more effective dating techniques for some arrangements? Right. So we're okay. familiar with thermal luminescence dating, but I don't know how accurate that is. And yeah. I, I can imagine maybe finding some sort of organic matter under the stone kind of date that. Is there anything else that's more effective? Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so dating generally in archaeology. Well, if we're looking at like stone arrangements, stone sites, I mean, okay, we, we have various relative dating techniques in archaeology. We find bits of pottery and other things that give some idea archaeologically where it might stand. That helps us. Direct scientific uh, uh, absolute dating techniques. Radiocarbon is the one everyone knows about, but of course you need organic material. So if you're, like if you're looking at a standing stone somewhere, you've kind of got to have the organic material from underneath it, which you, you, you hope may have been to do with some dedication ceremony or something. Then you may have, and if you've got enough of it, you may be able to get date that gives you an idea where the stone was put upright. The, um, as you say, the, the uh, thermoluminescence still is very vague, and, and, and so it, it, doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't give you much. Um, <clears throat> uh, you did ask this, but um, uh, where you've got wooden monuments, because we also have timber monuments, they don't last, but we can find post holes in the ground. Um, but if you have got some very uh, dry parts of the world, like Arizona or, or, or so on, or very wet parts of the world, like Somerset, England, uh, getting wetter by the day, it seems, um, then, then wood can be preserved. And where you've got wood preserved, you can do dendrochronology, tree ring dating. And, and that also can, that can help you. If you can get a sequence of tree rings, you know, basically some summers are hot and some summers are, are, are cold. The trees grow more in the hot summers, so you get wider tree rings. So if uh, like you have in California or in Northern Ireland, why this stuff was done in Northern Ireland, I'm not quite sure, but it was. Um, oaks in Northern Ireland or redwoods in California, you can get by, you can match these. So you can start with live ones, which you know the years of, and then match the rings going back and back. And you get a whole sequence going back even thousands of years. And then that, that helps you calibrate the radiocarbon, because of course wood is organic anyway. And that way you've got it, it for a timber site, you can, you can sometimes date very accurately, not the stone ones, of course. Um, something we did in Hawaii, we're very lucky, we have a different um, radio, a, a, a different um, um, uh, physic, physical method, um, again to do with um, uh, beta decay. But this is uh, it's from an isotope of thorium to uranium. Um, I don't think it's the other way, I think it's that way around. And basically, um, this is um, it's set up. It's a, a thing you can do with coral. And basically, if you, pick, if you pluck off a bit of branch coral under the sea, take it out, it starts this particular radioactive clock. And it's much more much more accurate than radiocarbon. Radiocarbon has a half life. If you know these things of five thousand years or so. Um, thorium uranium is fifty years. Um, and fortunately for us, when people build stone monuments in Hawaii. They had a tradition of plucking some bits of branch coral and shoving them in the walls. 
also round beach cobbles, that doesn't do us so good. But the, the, and with the thorium uranium dating, we can date some of them to plus or minus five years. And the fact that we're doing a big study of a part of the island of Maui and Hawaii, where we know the whole area and what its temples were built within a generation. We know that because of this other dating. So there are, there are various of these absolute dating techniques that help us. Um, which relates to a question I thought you were going to ask, but you didn't. Or maybe I thought you were one of you. But I don't know, I'm going to ask you, just suspecting you would have answered it. Which is, can you, uh, can you date things astronomically? Because if you think about it, if you've got something pointing at a star, then you can work out when that worked. Hence you can work out how old the thing, how the sign is. And the, likewise with the sun, if something pointing very accurately, you have to be very accurate with the sun because the, the, the motion is, is so small. Maybe you can date the sign. Um, and in theory, while you can do it, in practice, generally only fools dare to tread because um, the danger of circular argument is so huge. You've probably selected a site, you've found it solstitially, or you've decided maybe you lined on that star. And then you, you date the site on the basis of that, and th th this is a dangerously circular argument. Um, usually it works in some circumstances, but you have to have other data more than that. There's something similar related to the pyramids with that. With some sharks that were there, and the pyramids that were there, it was worked back, it matched stars all those years ago. I seem to remember reading something. Uh, by that, trying to date the pyramids by the Stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's what that was. What this, this, there was this. Um, wait a minute. I might even have a slide about that. That was this uh, Giza. Uh, did I mention that to you earlier, or, or did I mention the students no, no. just now? I think I just mentioned it passing. Right. Let's go with this. Um, okay. Right. Yeah. The idea. Of the the Giza pyramids. Stop me if I talked about this before. I think I talked about it an hour ago to the other group. That's my problem. Right, so the idea, I mentioned about selecting stars and other selecting pyramids, didn't I? And that's, this just illustrates that point. But the point here is that having already done that selection and got a result that actually isn't supportable in the first place, they then uh, start talking about the orientation of this and saying that it works best in 11,000 BC and not 3,000 BC, which is what we know from the archaeology of these things are actually built. Um, and so, so basically, it's, it's, it's a, a pack of cards, you know, you're, you're, you're doing one thing on top of another. If it was secure, if this, so if this sort of evidence actually proves something, which it doesn't, then you could try using that argument. But um, it, it, it doesn't, I mean, it, it starts with data that, that is, is, it just doesn't prove the argument. And it goes, it's worse than that because it actually then uh, argues against all the established archaeology. So, I mean, um, but yeah, in, in theory you could do this, but perhaps you have to be very careful. There are, we have actually tried to do it in Hawaii because we have got temples, we know from the cultural context that these temples devoted to a particular god, Lono, uh, who was the one they mistook Cook for when he landed on the wrong island, right? Um, they are all oriented on the rising of the Pleiades, we can detect that. And because we know the date, we, we can actually we can actually date it to within 50 years or so from the astronomy and see whether that fits the date from the uranium thorium dating. And that's a nice we, we don't start with astronomy, we see that they match and that's really neat. But it's it's exceptional to be able to do that. Hello. Um, I think we have seen um about the Oh, Chanty, yeah. 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 I was just wondering um, if I just met um, from June to December, they had 15 um, deep. Mm -hmm. And basically, it can, can be a use of the moon, right? Dark moon and full moon. Yeah, yeah. Of course, every 14 days, and you have a, a mountain. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I don't believe that it does that, um, but um, it's a very obvious thing. Now, I was just wondering if I had any other pictures that would help us here. Basically, the towers, well, all the middle towers, really do demarcate 10 day intervals. And as you say, the 10 day interval, it's like a third of the, the lunar month. 
We know that the lunar phase cycle month was really important to the Egyptians and so on, and to other people. We know it was important to the Hawaiians. Um, and um, so the idea that that may have been a 10-day uh, <coughs> is tempting. However, uh, if it was actually marking equal intervals of 10 days during the year, you would expect the towers at the ends to be further together because the sun, its, its rising position slows down as it gets towards the solstices at either end. So actually, the um, towers towards the ends, the last two or three each direction, mark intervals a lot longer than 10 days because they're roughly equally spaced. Um, and in fact, that is used by our critics to say, well, we don't believe it was a solar calendar because you would have the towers not equally spaced, you would have them, or roughly, you'd have them close together at the ends. <coughs> I don't think that this broke down, was actually breaking down into any particular uh, calendar that marked off, you know, uh, it, it, the whole year in a certain way. I, I think it was just a visual calendar by which you know, you knew that the, when, the, when the sun rose between those, those hills, that was the day you did something. And it doesn't, um, doesn't give us any evidence that there was some sort of structure to the, formal structure to the calendar 2,000 years before the Incas. So I think it was just a, a, a visual device for looking at someone on the horizon. Um, but it's tempting, and, and people have said that, because <coughs> it, it happens to be 10 day intervals in the middle. Um, I don't, did that, that answer your question? Yeah. I may have to just skip out and get oh no, I think I've got a water refill in here. I saw this coming. Yes. Okay. Fine. I'm with you. The threat of me carrying on and going on to the next one. This, oh, this, this question yeah. of of finding things yeah. and superimposing preconceived ideas on them. Yeah. And then saying this is proof right. of my idea. If it happens to be something which a crowd of people in South Africa are doing or have been doing for the past couple of years, mm. and um, it actually had a very interesting sequel because geological geolo geologist friends of mine mm. um, 